All right, so welcome everybody to the second Accessathon by Protest Access. We are so excited to have you all here. Um, I'm going to be going through this informational PowerPoint, do some introductions. So uh, thank you for being here and let's get started. For access information, today the panel is being interpreted by Pro Bono ASL and they should be pinned on the screen. Um, we also have live meaning for meaning transcription, which can be turned on in Zoom by clicking the CC button on the bottom bar or by following the link that's been posted in chat, which uh, has just been posted again. Our moderator, that's me, will be reading out visual descriptions for any images displayed and our panelists will be visually describing themselves during introductions as well. And tech support and our host, Sam, whose pronouns are they, them, or EM. If you experience any tech or access issues, please message them directly so that they can assist. So who are we? Protest Access provides post-production accessibility for social justice content so that deaf, hard of hearing, blind, visually impaired people, and English language learners can be involved in social justice conversations. In doing this work, we are committed to centering disabled Black and Indigenous people of color at all times. And a land acknowledgement, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge that there is no accessibility or social justice without the Indigenous and Native communities on whose unoccupied and unseated, um, sorry, occupied and unceded land we live. So just to give kind of an explanation of how this meeting is going to run, our chat is closed so that participants can only send messages to either me or to the host, Sam. And we encourage you to send in any questions that come up as you're listening, but all questions are going to be screened first and I will be reading them out loud. And panelists, you are also not obligated to answer any questions that you are uncomfortable answering. So if I ask any question at any time that you don't wanna answer, you can just say, I'm not going to answer that and no questions asked, we will move on. Um, additionally, I would like to ask the panelists, would you be more comfortable if attendees who uh, are comfortable doing so turned on their cameras? No, okay. Uh, Tino? Either way is fine with me. Okay. Raven's saying I'm flexible as well. Okay, great. And we will move on. Um, I'd like to remind everyone to please respect each panelist's personhood and experiences. This is a place for listening and learning and not for judgment. Um, and please be mindful, don't ask any invasive questions or questions that ask the panelists to detail personal trauma. Uh, panelists are only gonna share stories and information on their own terms. So it's a gift to have them here with us today. Please be respectful. We have a zero tolerance policy regarding the use of any slurs or offensive language. And if a participant breaks these rules, they will not only be removed from the event, but banned from attending any future events. This is not the time to, to mess around like that. So, and actually before we get into the agenda, I do just want to clarify for, every, clarify for everyone as well. Um, there will be pauses while I'm speaking uh, to allow time for interpreters to finish interpreting and to just make sure that we don't speed ahead um, so that everyone is able to be involved in the conversation. And also just a quick reminder to everyone participating to try and minimize crosstalk as well. So uh, here's the agenda. We're going to be doing our introductions. We're going to have our discussion then we will have an audience member Q&A session and then any final remarks. This is me. Uh, my name is Micah. My pronouns are they, them. I am a co-founder and the logistics consult for Protest Access. There is an image of me on this slide. Uh, I have black hair, which is longer on top and shorter on the sides. I'm wearing a maroon sweater and I've got a big old smile on. I also wear glasses. And today, as I look, I do look a bit different. My hair on top is much longer and it is blue. 
I am wearing a snapback and a gray sweater and I do still have my glasses. Our first panelist is Tinu Abayomi Paul, she, her pronouns. Tinu is an author, entrepreneur, patient advocate, and the creator of hashtag everywhere accessible. You can find her on Twitter at Tinu. Um, and Tinu, if you'd like to visually describe yourself. Sorry, Tinu, you're muted. There we yeah. go. <laughs> it's a thing popped up to tell me. Today I have um, long black hair and uh, that's curly at the ends. I have a dark, a chestnutty, I guess, dark skin. I'm wearing a brown dress and there's a white background behind me, which includes a door because it's a classic. I think that's everything. Awesome. And in the picture, Tino looks pretty much as described and is wearing a uh, red lipstick and gold hoop earrings. Our next panelist is T. Franklin, pronouns also she, her. T is a best-selling award-winning author of Bingo Love and Joke Joint and the creator of hashtag Black Comics Month, hashtag Make Ableists Uncomfortable and hashtag Disabled People Deserve. And you can find her at Miss T. Franklin on Twitter. Um, her picture, she is wearing rainbow braids tied up in like a beautiful bun with uh, braids coming down and a colorful dress and a big smile. <laughs> And T, if you would like to describe yourself, please. Hey, um, I am wearing a brown sweater. And the top looks like a pizza slice, but it's not pizza. It's brown and like checkered crochet and buttons. And my hair is like. I don't know, it's in a bun with some gold earrings and there's a guitar in the background, a, a cigar box guitar and a red vase. And I have fancy lips, the uh, lip gloss on and I'm really high and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Tino. And I'm going to say period, <laughs> period. Our third panelist is Raven Sutton, pronouns she, her. Raven is a dedicated disability advocate, ASL performer, and social worker. And you can find her on Twitter at freelove19xx. Uh, in the picture on the slide, she has blue hair and there's a, a head wrap that kind of comes up to two knots at the top. Um, a very cool nose decoration that's kind of swirly like a snake. And uh, beautiful, I think they're wood earrings. And Raven, if you would like to describe yourself. Hi, everyone. Today I have on some glasses. I also have a different hairstyle. It's kind of in a Bantu knot with um, colorful earrings. As you can see here is my ears is tan as well as brown and orange kind of circles on my ears. And I also have a white shirt on. And I also have a cardigan with, I think, a light pink, blue-ish, um, gray uh, cardigan. And my background is tan. And there's a, a darker tan at the bottom. So yeah, that's it. Thank you, Raven. Also, since I neglected to describe my background, I have a Zoom background on. It's basically the Windows 95 you know, big open grass field and blue sky with clouds. And our next panelist is Ashley Fawbush. She, her pronouns. Ashley is a standards advisor, community manager, and the branding chair here at Protest Access. And you can find her on Twitter at uh, Un Angel, I believe is how you would say it, but there is a one instead of the L. Um, and Ashley, if you'd like to describe yourself as well, or, oh, sorry, I need to describe the photo. Um, Ashley has hair coming down on I believe it would be her right, our left, and has an excellent pose and glasses. And Ashley, if you'd like to describe yourself, please. Um, I am a black woman with light brown skin. I'm wearing round brown glasses and I'm wearing a like white wireless headphones and a my uh, black and gold Black Lives Matter shirt. And in the background is my library and the white door. Thank you so much. All right. 
And our next panelist, um, this is actually my fault, Julia. I'm so sorry. I should have checked with you beforehand to uh, learn how to pronounce your last name. Um, would you like to speak it now? Would you like me to give my best attempt? Sure, I can um, speak it. My name is Julia Rose Carpitch. So car like an automobile and pitch like pitch a ball. Carpitch? Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome, okay. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, so our next panelist is Julia Carpitch. she, her pronouns. Julia is an advisory board member here at Protest Access and a scholar studying different types of access labor in university settings. And you can find her on Twitter at Rosum. Um, in the picture here, Julia is standing in a kind of a three quarters pose to the camera, has her hair up in kind of a fun, messy updo and is wearing bright red lipstick and pearls. And Julia, if you'd like to describe yourself now. Sure, so my look is pretty much always consistent. I am still wearing an updo. Um, so my hair is up in a bun. Um, I have on a black shirt. Um, and I'm a black woman with light brown skin. I'm wearing um, big earrings that are beaded palm, palm leaves. Um, yeah, thank you. Also with my uh, mistake about the names in mind, if I have mispronounced anyone's name so far, um, please let me know and I will take the time to learn how to pronounce it correctly because that is very important to me. Names are a big part of us. Um, so I just want to open the floor to make sure that if I have mispronounced anyone's name that I can get it right, spend the time to get it right right now. A biomi Paul. A biomi Paul. Yeah. Okay, is that correct? Yeah. A biomi. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. Okay. I should have checked with you beforehand, but I appreciate the correction now. So, Tinu a biomi, Paul. Yep. Perfect. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. And you can follow us on social media at Protest Access on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And you can also visit our website at protestaccess.org. And I believe that is the last slide. So I will turn off screen share. All right. Here we go with questions, I suppose. <laughs> so first of all, I guess, kind of how the hell did we get here? Um, how did you become an advocate? Did you make a concrete decision? Did you want to be an advocate? Did you set out to be an advocate or was it kind of thrust upon you and you just sort of took that on? And this is open, of course, to any of our panelists. I didn't really decide to be an advocate at first. At first, I was just trying to get everything that I needed for myself. And um, then I started learning things that could be applied to other people and sharing that information. And I realized since I was already an activist for black people that all of my identities, I should be doing some kind of activism for, that was my personal de decision. So that's when it became something larger around the time that I started to recover from cancer and couldn't really do anything else. I was really bored <laughs> to tell the truth and I just wanted to share my experience and share the information because I'd never heard of any other spoonie or person with chronic illness that had cancer before at the same time. So I wanted other people to see what my experience was and that if it happened to them, that it wasn't the end of the world and their coping mechanisms, et cetera, and ways to get everything that you're supposed to get during treatment and all those things. Hi, this is T. Um, I do not consider myself to be an activist, an advocate, or an, any other A word. Um, that's not me. I'm just a really vocal bitch. And I speak up for everybody that deserves it. Um, and, and being disabled and being treated like crap, um, I'm not going to sit by and be quiet. So I get why people label me that, but I am absolutely, that is not me. I'm just vocal, I'm loud, I'm gonna say what I gotta say. So that's my experience. I'm T. Franklin and I'm done speaking.
Um, for me, my experience, I think the same. I don't really like to label myself as an advocate. When I was in college, I always kind of envisioned um, a deaf person. You know, so for example, like I come from a deaf family. I come from gener a generation of a deaf family. Like, sorry, interpreters, internet is glitching for a second. Interpreter is going to switch since the interpreter is having some internet glitching. All right, we're going to say, okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, so, um, oh, what was I saying? Uh, okay, yeah, so um, so how I identified um, self-advocacy, I'm an advocate. Um, I did go to college. Um, I grew up really um, speaking up for myself, you know, um, very outgoing. Um, and I um, envisioned a person um, you know, for a deaf person, what did that look like for everyone else? Um, I, I, I didn't want to put the framework of deaf into a box. Um, and how do I spread the lineage um, and culture? On my mom's side, um, no one was deaf. Um, everyone was hearing. Um, and on my dad's side, um, there were deaf family members, um, but they had to grow up oral. Um, I w went to a, a hearing school and um, I was the known as the deaf girl um, with the fun style. Um, I had like pendants, necklaces. Um, I, I mean, just, I've made a lot of stuff, you know? And um, and kids did tease me. Um, they picked on me, you know, oh, I was the girl that got on the short yellow bus. I was bullied a lot. Um, and I was always kicked out of school, I had to go to um, secondary school. Um, but that was the grooming for speaking up for myself. Um, and that's how I learned to stand up for myself. Um, and and how later, how, I mean, that just later came on as the activation for me. And it kind of was sudden. Um, with my experience, um, I did later on transfer to an institute. Um, I went to high school, uh, oh my gosh, it wasn't really, um, so that high school, I didn't quite fit in, right? Um, so uh, I, again, had to be oral, had to learn speech, um, and I was hard of hearing. Um, and so, um, and again, I'm sorry to re reiterate that high school was a um, school of um, both he hard of hearing and hearing kids. And it was hard identifying with them as well. Um, and so when I went to uh, college, uh, we had an audi audiology appointment, testing done, um, and so then my found out that my hearing, it just, I went profoundly deaf. Um, and so a general experience um, with community um, globally and how people see me. Um, and, and it's funny, they'll all just assume because I learned speech and I can speak, I self-vocalize that I don't need an interpreter. Um, it, it's, and I think a lot of things are mended to make it easy for them. Um, and so I have to compromise for the hearing community or for that person in front of me. Um, and I have my access to an interpreter or communication, effective communication compromise. Um, and a lot of people don't understand um, me and me being deaf. Um, no, you're hard of hearing. Um, and when people hear the word hard of hearing, they'll, they, they, you know, it becomes a, oh, okay, well, um, uh, you know, I don't know why people are afraid to use the word deaf. I mean, I'm hard of hearing, yeah, um, that's the science of it, but identifying, um, I am deaf. And so, and that's been the mindset I've, I've realized across the board. And so I've been trying to explain to, on my mom's side, my family, to doctors, um, to the world, again, I mean, I need an interpreter, right? Um, there has to be some kind of equivalency. Um, I don't know what the idea is um, with deaf people. Uh, and it's funny, I went to Gallaudet, and the immersion there was totally different. Um, the process of living, um, uh, going from one world to the other. I mean, there were roadblocks, there were stumbling blocks, things, hurdles I had to get over. Um, there was no interpreter at times actually. 
Um, in the hearing world, there were no uh, captioning, no access. And so um, there were a huge amount of moments where I would complain. <laughs> um, and I felt like I, there had to be something done, right? So I took the initiative. Um, I started signing uh, music in ASL. And it was so funny. It's kind of threw people off about um, ASL and what it looked like for me. Um, and it was it's interesting. Oh, people are like, oh, you can't hear, but you can speak. Uh, and so they were thrown aback, taken aback with that. Um, so being deaf um, and knowing music, knowing speech, um, it was it, in itself conflicted. There are two conflicting ideas, and a lot of people did not believe me. Um, no, no way. BS. You didn't grow up deaf. Um, I had to learn speech. And so I, in that schema, in that slew of living, I've had to learn to speak up for myself. I had to learn to stand up for who I was. And as a Black person, um, I mean, it's, I've been my, my own best advocate <laughs> in truth. Um, and for... Um, I'm sorry. What was, interpret and get that spelling again. Um, when Trayvon Martin, when that incident happened, um, and there were a huge amount of protests happening, um, I thought, hey, I need to be involved. So I went out, joined um, the cause. Um, I had two friends I went with. And I mean, we had been researching, studying history um, and everything that had been going on with racist, racism. Um, and so uh, jumping forward, there was, um, so my real and authentic understanding of what was happening, um, especially concerning Trayvon Martin, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, again, you already know at this point, I'm not a quiet person, right? Um, so yeah, that, it was, just, it was huge. Ashley and Julia, did you want to add anything or shall we move on? Okay, I guess we will move on. Um, obviously, the elephant in the room is the pandemic. Um, and I would like to know, given the challenges of the pandemic itself, navigating a frankly broken health system, etc. How has that impacted you and your work? And what impact have you seen on the disabled communities that you are involved with? Well, I'll go first again. Uh, I don't have health insurance and it was really scary in the beginning because there's a grant in this county of Texas, Texas, um, Tarrant County. It's called, um, well, I don't remember what it's called, but they have these facilities, JPS health that I can go to, to get all of my, you know, to get a lot of my needs taken care of by paying like a copay against this big grant that they have. So when they shut that down, it was, I was already having problems with, you know, arranging transportation and scheduling and getting there. And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, I have these, all these appointments coming up and I can't go and they're not open. And it was really disturbing. There was also the issue of, okay, all of us, a lot of us um, who are disabled or have chronic illness, you know, we're in the house already. I'm like 70% housebound. I get so excited when I get to dress up and do something like this because I don't go out that much. And then everybody came home. Everybody came home and I started to see all the accommodations that were being made for all the able people. And it really upset me because a lot of the reason why a lot of us are home is because they say they can't do stuff for us or we can't send that controlled medication to your house. Pandemic, all of a sudden, yes, you can. You know, you can't do that job from home. Pandemic, all of a sudden, yes, you can. So especially as we revert back to, well, some people, because I'm not reverting back, I intend to wear a mask until <laughs> like forever. But as some people are reverting back to the way it used to be or whatever, you know, I'm seeing a lot, I'm still seeing that, okay, we can't do, we can't do, except with my, um, the, the clinic that I go to, they kept telehealth and they kept, video health. So that part of it 
you know, made improvements for, for the rest of it, you know, and I'm also in Texas. They don't wear masks here. They just looked at the mask mandate. It's just kind of a, mostly a mess here in Texas and it, the pandemic ending and some of the restrictions going away is making things go back to the much worse way they were before. So there's no improvements for, you know, somebody like me who's in the house and I, I, I don't know. I didn't enjoy the pandemic. It was hellish, but I'm also not happy about the things that are not being kept from that era. Thank you, Tina. Did anyone else want to speak on this topic? I can. This is Julia. Is that okay? I, I can't see. I'm on my phone, so I can't see much happening. So if. Okay. Um, so when I think about how COVID has impacted me and the communities that I'm around, I really think about access to psychiatric services and how much that's been disrupted for me um, and for folks that I'm in community with um, and care about and, and for and with. Um, and the kind of feeling like there's, um, advocacy has kind of taken, it's its own, I don't want to say job, that's not the right word, but it has its own role in my life. So I show up on Zoom kind of in one role and capacity. And then as soon as I close the computer, there's a whole other world that is consumed by trying to access services and navigate inaccessible systems. And um, so many of the limitations, I think, in not accessing therapy and psychology and psychological services, but psych psychiatric care, um, how difficult that's been um, navigating insurance companies, the lack of providers, um, folks' unwillingness to take on the liability to see clients with certain psychiatric conditions um, has just shaped so much of my time um, out of work. And so, yeah, so it's, and it's not always something that I feel like I can talk about. So it kind of becomes these, it feels like I have um, two, two really separate parts of myself um, and that can be really hard. This is Julia and I am done speaking. Thank you so much, Julia. So related to both what Tinu and Julia were saying, um, what impact do you, you anticipate the pandemic having given the long-term health effects that it is going to have on so many people, both physically and mentally? Um, where do you see this going, I guess? Do you think that maybe society at large will be more willing to think about accommodations? Do you think it's going to take a little more for society to kind of start learning that lesson? What do you hope for even? Um, for people to learn from this? Accommodations. Accommodations? <laughs> That's a joke. That is a joke. Um, we can't even get accommodations for a disabled trans author without bullshit happening. But that's another topic for another day. Please pre-order Meet Cute Diary by Emery, Emery Lee. There are, I am, I deal with agoraphobia, slight agoraphobia, as well as a multitude of health issues, including allergies. I'm happy for my people and other people getting the vaccine. I can't. It will put me in a coma. And after being in a coma, it said I probably won't come out. So what does that mean for me? I'm stuck in a house. I mean, I like being in a house anyway, but now I really can't leave. The way people have acted during this whole pandemic puts me, my children, my 80 year old mother at risk. I'm not gonna trust your ass to keep me safe. 
I can't do it. You can't wear a mask without bitching. You can't stay in the house. You're bored. Bitch, let me tell you how bored I have been for several years. Stuck in the house. Unable to move. And you kids, you can't sit your narrow ass down and chill the hell out and watch Netflix. But I'm supposed to trust you to make sure I don't die. No. Like, the selfishness is what I noticed. Like, it, it was on a whole nother level. And it was because of the fact it was only going to, from the beginning, it was only going to mess with old folks and those with uh, immunocompromised shit. That's it, right? So everybody else, hey, we're going to turn up. We're going to go. We're going to go to spring break. We're going to do whatever we got to do because we it don't affect us. It affects them. People we don't care about anyway. We don't care about the elderly. And we damn sure don't care about the disabled. Until they start dropping like flies. Now they suddenly they want to care. But it's just like half-ass caring. I can't, I can't have that. I, I, like, I like to live. I like to breathe. I love to eat. And I love to smoke. I can't do that if I'm dead. But nobody cares. And not caring is a huge problem because your bitch ass ain't exempt from being disabled at any point in your lives. Um, I'm Steve Franklin and I'm done speaking. Thank you, T. I think I am also myself disabled. Um, and I think one thing that this pandemic has definitely done is highlighted the fact that there are quite a lot more people than I would like there to be who do place some kind of hierarchy on human lives. And we see that across multiple marginalized communities, of course. Um, do you think that perhaps the fact that it's now really kind of been set on the table, I think at this point there have been so many things happening one after another that show that there are people who have some kind of hierarchy of human lives in their internal idea of the world. Do you think that it's finally at a point where people who are really willfully trying to ignore um, won't be able to ignore it any longer? And also, I do have a message. I just want to be sure. Raven, have you been trying to speak? Have I been speaking over you? Oh, no, no. Um, I'm just letting everyone get their turns. Um, and so I was just waiting for a good break where I can jump in. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm done with my question. So if anyone would like to take it away, Raven, if you'd like to take it away. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Can we repeat the question again. So I want to make sure that I'm going on topic. Just can you repeat the question? Yeah, of course. Um, essentially, I think the pandemic and the multiple protests, um, the multiple incidences where people are losing their lives, specifically black people. And then, of course, with the shootings in Atlanta, um, Asian people as well. And with the, I guess, um, reaction like, oh, only old people get it, only disabled people get it, that kind of thing. It's really being shown that there are a lot of people who have an internal hierarchy of human lives, like some humans are more deserving of life than others. And this is something that a lot of us have known for a long time, but there are a lot of people who have been willfully ignorant. Do you think that we're finally reaching a point where people really can't ignore it anymore? Do you think that this is heralding some change or do you think that there's still a lot further to go? Uh, honestly, I think it's the same thing with the Black Lives Matter, right? That movement, people want to interview them. They wanna interview even deaf people. Honestly, with me, I think it's fake. I think it's all a performance act I don't think it's real at all because where were you way before these incidents? 
We've been talking about this. Where have you been? We've been here. You care when you want to care, when you're curious about these communities, but you never actually were doing that before. You know, you weren't at home on social media. Now you're on home social media looking and now you care and now you're reposting, but it's all fake. When the world, you know, opens back up again, will it be safe? I don't know. Will the, will the violence still continue? Yes, but I doubt the people that said they were going to help are going to help because people really do not care about anything unless it hurts them personally, or if it's personally their family. And, oh, that never happened to me, so that's not my problem. That attitude, oh, that's not my life. Oh, sorry about your life, I'm pitying you. It's just this problem that everyone um, seems to have and they can just ignore it. They choose to ignore it. You know, they choose to learn and unpack and step up, you know, what is right. And then sometimes they don't. And sometimes they're just like, oh, that's so awful. I'm sorry that you experienced that. And they just continue their ableism through and through. And the impression just still keeps coming. And they start seeing, oh, I don't see color. That's not me. I support anyone that has a disability and all these things and all these phrases. But at the same time, you're taking over our space you are doing things like you're being like the savior um, complex. And it's just like, why are you doing this? They keep saying all these things like they're pitying us, but I don't need your pity. I need accommodations. I don't need your sorries. I don't need your apologies. I need change, right? Let's get it going. It's 2021. What are we doing? We're talking about the same thing. And someone just commented on Twitter the other day and said, you're always saying negative things about hearing people and um, how I'm an advocate. And I believe that I'm doing the right thing as a hearing person. You're making me feel low. That's not my problem is what I tell them you're feeling low is because what I'm saying you're unpacking with it and you're relating with it and so you know people are following me because I'm good at doing ASL music and they're so fascinated but the reason why I'm signing these songs is because these signs are not accessible for deaf people and so at the same time these deaf people and hard of hearing people really want to enjoy this music because we can feel vibration we can feel this it's not just one world. You could see that it could be 3D. You, we can smell, we could touch, we can do all these things. We have all our other senses. So for people to approach us as um, people to be pitied on, that's an issue. We are human just like you. This community, we're part of your community as well as humans. So what are you talking about? Posting these videos about the coronavirus and relating to you know, safety tips and different videos relating to um, anything with the news, everyone needs to know that. We all need to survive through this and we all need to know what to do and what is going on. So for your captions on your videos not to even be there, that means you're not trying to include me. And that means you don't care about me or my life and that you don't care about that I don't know anything that's going on. And so I have to advocate for myself because if not, I won't know anything and I won't survive. So really just impact me. And I already know that people just don't care in general. If their life is perfect, they'll just go on and on by just living their life. And during this pandemic, I just really got to see, I get to not even see regular people, but like I see people on the government level, on media level, on news level, and how the fuck can a police department hire someone who was not certified to freaking interpret about what is going on on a national disaster weather type of app or media and not make sure that that person was certified and a professional interpreter to, expl to explain some, you know, information that is large. And so it's just awful because now all my deaf people are like, what are we doing? What, what can we do? They don't even have access to this information. They're stuck, you know, with no food, no water and things like that. And, and people are not seeing how that affects everyone, how everyone are paranoid if they don't have access. And so just people just really, there's some people that are just lucky. There's some people that don't have to worry about their life as much. And that's just very selfish, especially when you already know and you're already educated about something and you still choose to do something else and not to care because it's not your problem. That is the worst kind of human that you could be. And we're all here to survive, all of us. This is our journey here, but we're also here together.
people that live on individualistic platform are not gonna work out because we're not individuals. We need everybody, we need each other. And we need to be good to each other, be a good neighbor and unpack and have these discussions and talk and not take over space and not to pity other people. It's really important. And so that was just, that's just me. I'm sorry for my rant, but that's just me. There is no need to apologize. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, and related to that, have you, we've discussed obviously people who are just performative allies or not even trying at all. Um, have you seen people actually stepping up to practice real allyship? And what does real allyship look like to you? Um, I have seen some of that, but uh, I think I'm a special case because I cultivate that space around me that if you're not serious about doing, to me, it takes, if everybody did a little bit, we would get a lot further. And so a lot, especially a lot of the performative kind of allies, those kind of people, they're useful in, to me in that they will do that little bit. But most people come from that me culture, like Raven was saying, and not like an us culture, which is the one that I was born into. I'm Nigerian by ancestry. I'm first generation born in America. And in my house, it was like a little Nigeria. We I got the values from my parents that we can't survive with the, without each other. You can't do things alone. Extended family is important. So I got all of that growing up to the extent that we, when I became grown, I don't know how to not care about people. I, I don't know what that is. So for a long time, especially when I was coming up in the nineties, because you know, they had that whole Afrocentric, activism kind of thing that comes around every 20, 30 years. I thought that up until that point, I thought that people were like us, that they cared because that was my experience. But then going out into the world, you find out people can care about a person, people can, pair, can care about their problem and people that they know but people are not really, especially in America and especially in the West, set up to care about everybody. It's not an everybody culture. So it's weird because I expect that and I'm disappointed by it, but I still have hope every time that it's gonna be different. And it never is. Um, I would say that this time around, I did notice a difference because I've been through this whole everybody's gonna try to push for change thing a couple of times before. And the thing that's different this time is the younger people. And the thing that I see that's different about them is that, you know, we had the boomer generation, which I'm just not even gonna talk about right now. Then we had the X generation where we saw all these rules and said, okay, all these rules are bullshit. But I don't know if I'm the only one who thinks that because we didn't have social media. And you had millennials who were like, this is all ridiculous and I'm not going to do it anymore. And then you have the Zoomers who were like, oh, no, I'm going to go ahead and start changing things because I'm not waiting for y'all. You know, um, the two sets of twins during the pandemic grew so much and have done so much and are willing to do so much to change how things are going and are so flexible about how they want things to be different. But I also think they're so young, it's not fair to put it all on them. So I find myself perplexed about how we are gonna be moving forward because they're, to me, really the first generation to get, probably from this pandemic experience, that we can't continue in this country with this individualistic idea of how to make it in life and how to move, how to be successful in life or how to even just survive. Because just me is gonna fail every time because you need the resources of other people, you need community, you need people around you and you need community and the government and you need all of those structures to work together or else we're just BSing and we're never gonna get anywhere. So I'm hopeful about that, but at the same time, I look at what's happening in the government, especially with um, 
you know, I don't want to get political, but the current administration was kind of all my list of last choices. And I'm happy that certain things are moving forward, but I also feel like we're back to the original set of things that couldn't get done. Um, especially including accommodations for for us because they see us have had, as having, and I hate this phrase, special needs. No, I just have needs. Everybody has needs and I have needs too. And you've called them special so that you can make an excuse for not accommodating me. So I don't know if, if what has happened is enough to move us forward. I really don't know, but I do see a difference from the last couple of times that I've been through this whole raise in consciousness, um, this collective, I should say, raise in consciousness. Um, I think I'm done speaking. Thank you so much. Did anyone want to add to that before we move on, Ashley? And, and Raven as well? Okay. Um, I was just gonna add because I, I heard Tinu say growth and <laughs> I definitely think that if there is gonna be any type of true allyship, it has to come with being uncomfortable. A lot of people are like, they want a quick fix. Like, tell me what I can do, what books can I read? How am I going to you know, get over it? And it has to be, you have to be uncomfortable with the questions that are, that are coming from, from this movement, excuse me. Um, a lot of people are not comfortable talking about race. A lot of people are not comfortable acknowledging their privilege. Um, they're not comfortable talking about participating in a lot of the jokes or a lot of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just the, um, the microaggressions. So you have to be uncomfortable and acknowledge and be willing to grow from that. I don't know if that was helpful, but that's what I took from it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Raven, you had something to say as well? Yeah, I wanted to say that I feel like, what does Ali, like Ali ship look like for you all? Because people don't really understand what an Ali is or what it looks like. Everyone has different um, vision or envisions about this certain type of person and different ways of oppression and different ways people take space or they feel like, oh, you insulted me, you make me feel low, you're being negative about the situation. But honestly, people, people who are oppressed do not need to be nice to the oppressor. They don't have to be nice, you know? And it's not about being pity or feeling bad, it's just listening to me. And you're not gonna be comfortable. And you shouldn't be comfortable, to be honest, because I'm not comfortable. Why should you be comfortable? Because you call yourself an ally? And for example, what happened to me last night? I experienced going to the emergency room. Um, I had allergic reaction to something and I was struggling to get an uh, interpreter or a video relay service interpreter to the front desk to help me with my appointment. And so instead of them getting someone, they just went in to go get an older woman that says, oh, I know ASL. But when she started to sign, she only finger spelled. It was, wasn't an advanced signing. It wasn't what I needed in that or not even someone that is certified. So maybe she thought that she was helping me. Maybe she thought that she was an ally and supporting me because she knew finger spelling, but she was not. You know, a real ally would tell the people at the front desk, I am not certified. I am not a professional interpreter. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the abilities or I'm qualified to interpret a medical appointment because understand that this, this is not something that is comfortable. I am in an emergency room. I need a video relay service interpreter to come. And that's what an ally is supposed to do is to advocate for that, not to take over and interpret for me because I don't even understand what she is saying. That's pointless at that point, right? So trying to argue and I'm trying to help her, it's like, what? That's not even being an ally. You're not helping me. And so it's just this worst things that just happened to me in the emergency room because I am struggling to communicate instead of figuring out what I'm actually allergic to. Why did I have allergic reaction? Instead, the time is being spent on fighting for myself to find someone to interpret for me. 
And then you have to pay for these services. Why do I have to pay that off? Can you just call and have it ready for me? What? Like, why am I looking for my own interpreter in the office to come and interpret for me and they're not even certified? And so I'm very thankful that my best friend was there because she helped advocate for me because I couldn't breathe. I had trouble breathing. My throat felt like it was numb and that it was closing. And these are things that are happening to me and I'm struggling. And all I needed was an interpreter, but I was ignored, you know? And I was ignoring them for a certain time so I can just get a video relay service interpreter in, involved. And I just didn't know. They didn't know that I was deaf. They didn't know that I needed someone there to interpret for me. They did not communicate effectively through their staff. There was no reason that that doctor inside of that room did not know that I needed someone there to interpret or a video relay service or that I was even deaf before they even put the IV in me. Because the IV medicine was huge. I don't know what was going on. I just know that it was in it. And I needed an interpreter there to clearly finger spell what was going on, everything that is going on, because that is access, but it wasn't accessible for me. And I think people felt like they were advocating and that they were doing a good thing or a good job, but really they didn't, they did not advocate. It was an awful experience. And to try to argue with me about my rights and to have the privilege to take over my space and to oppress me at the same time again, it was just really, I have these trust issues with Ali, with Ali's in, in general, because people have the privilege to change their mind at any time, right? And they can decide one day I'm not, uh, if, I did, if I was the person to change my mind and be like, oh, I'm not deaf anymore, I don't have to do that. I don't have that privilege. And I'm still learning, so other people need to still learn as well. And they need to do the work. They need to learn how to communicate to everyone. I did say something before in another panel that I want to mention here in this panel. Some people think, oh, I want to support the deaf community. I'm going to become an ally, so I'll go ahead and take a job in a, a deaf-related a deaf, deaf community type of job. That's not being an ally because you're taking jobs from the deaf people in the deaf community who are having a hard time finding a job themselves. So are you thinking, oh, let me teach American Sign Language as a hearing person. Now you took away another job from a deaf person to teach their own native language to other people. So these things are happening and we need to handle our own community inside and to really teach other people outside the community these things because we need hearing people outside of the world and different things like politics or doctor's office or different things like that to advocate for us and to use sign language and to voice for the deaf people in the deaf community so, so we can stop having these myths or these misconceptions. That's what an ally is supposed to be doing and that's what they should be doing and having those discussions about because they will listen to a hearing person rather than a deaf person in those incidents because they see people who have disability as someone that's just complaining. Why are you complaining? Why do you want all these accommodations? What do you need all this for? And everything that they're doing or if they do accommodate is wrong. So if hearing people who do not have a disability go on the outside and tell people what we need and to fight for what we're fighting for, it would help us out. And then at the same time, and I wish that, and I wish that I could be able to do these things right, but I need them to know what deaf people or disabled people are going through and that we keep advocating for ourselves and we keep doing this for ourselves and we're going to continue to uplift and to stand up because that is our place to do that. So that is I need an ally like that. Thank you so much. That was again Can wonderful. Have- Julia. Yes, if I can, um, so one of the things with the discussion that's happening around allyship, I think um, what Ashley mentioned about being uncomfortable and um, so thinking about from, I work in universities and I think um, systems, university systems, like Raven was describing hospital systems, approach access as a, a I think, I think we might have lost Julia. Oh, I see you again. 
Sorry, my phone is like, I'm overheating. <laughs> I can't do this right now. I apologize, y'all. That's okay. Um, um, so in, from an institutional perspective, I think folks get really complacent with the idea that univers- the institution has a policy and so that if and when an access request or an accommodation policy somehow is enough, um, that they'll be able to do the right thing. And I think um, what, you know, and the work, thinking about the work that, that protest access does, that like recognizing that access is a constant, everything is related to access. Everything that you do, you know, everything about your day is related to the ability to access something, the world, um, social interaction, services, space, cultural spaces, you know, learning spaces. Um, And I think that that shift that recognizing that it's not like Ashley was saying, just reading a book one time about disability history, that access is a, um, it's a lived embodied practice. It's every day. Um, And so for folks who are joining, who are involved in some of the work that um, protest access does and volunteering, I think thinking about some of your own personal spaces or your own personal social media spaces and are the practices that you use in your volunteer work with protest access are those things that you also do um I don't want to say offline but kind of in your own personal like on your Instagram on your Twitter like thinking about how am I really making this a part of the way that I navigate and orient to the world um because it's not just okay now I'm putting on my access hat to do access work, like it really has to become embedded in what we do every day. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, Before, I do wanna move on to audience questions because we are coming close to the end of our time, but before I do so, uh, was there anyone who wanted to say anything else on this topic? Um, Just really quickly, I wanted to say, I don't trust the word ally anymore because it's overused. And people think that if you're doing the bare minimum of the suggestions that you found in some book that you're an ally. But what I'm really looking for is an accomplice, like to get in the good trouble with me. So that if I need something, like when you, I'm gonna compare it to when I was a lot younger and used to do a little bit of dirt. The dirt that I would do, my girls were in it with me. If I started a fight in the club, we were all fighting in the club. And that's the kind of accomplice I want. If I'm fighting the government, everybody should be fighting with that person who's leading or those people who are leading. So if the deaf community tells me, I prefer we do it this way, I'm gonna go with what they say because, you know, I mean, I do have a um, audio processing disorder, but I'm not, you know, they're um, part of their community. They're not part of my community, if you see what I'm saying. So I'm gonna follow their lead and go with it the way where they're going because that's what they want. It doesn't you know, make sense for me to supplant my own preferences or likes or amount of contr- contribution that I'm gonna do. You have to be all in it or all out of it. This whole half stepping thing isn't really helpful for anything except if you want like a hashtag to trend. <laughs> No, so yeah, I'm done talking. That's my two cents. Thank you so much. Um, I am gonna open the floor to audience questions. If anyone in the audience would like to send me a direct message, any questions that they might have, um, now would be the time. And while we are waiting for any questions to come in, I do wanna ask if any of the panelists have you mentioned a hashtag, Tino, if there is a hashtag or any kind of cause that you would like to speak up about. Um, I know T, you mentioned Emery Lee's book, um, which I did put the title in the chat for everyone. Um, but if any of you would have any kind of cause that you would like to uh, announce to to our audience while we wait for questions to come in, please go ahead. Um, normally here, I would probably talk about myself, um, but You can find all that stuff on my profile. And when you come to see me, I wanna call more attention to the Samarian Humphrey issue 
the Plano um, Independent School District is acting like the issue is resolved, and I'll get to what the issue is in one second. But it's not. They did the the um, child and the parent who suffered the racial violence as well as bullying. As they have not gotten um, satisfaction for what has happened to them, um, and I don't want to traumatize anybody, so I'm not going to go into specifics, but you can um, look up the hashtag yourself and see what happened to this 11-year-old boy. Um, and I have 11 year old, so it makes me a little bit emotional, but um, his name is Samarian Hem um, Humphrey. It's S-E-M-A-R-I-O-N. So if you look for hashtag justice for Samarian, you'll see all of the things that happened to him. Um, it was an extended bullying period. Then they were they tricked him into thinking that, you know, one of them was friends with him. Then there was an additional bullying plus racial violence committed against this child. And only four of the six boys who did it were punished. And they gave them bullying punishments instead of hate crime punishments. And um, I believe they're a bunch of 13 year olds. And um, it's, uh, not enough what Plano has done. They say they're going to do diverse, diversity and inclusion. And we all know that's usually BS. It's usually some, you know, I don't, they're saying it's going to be an independent body that does a program or whatever, but it's not going to be enough. And then what about the outgoing students? What about the incoming students? What about the future that is going to make them realize that what they did was not okay? And also to make the other parents in the school realize that bullying isn't cool on just on its face. So putting the racial stuff on top of it is additionally not cool. They're all acting like it's not a big deal. And part of it is yes, because the Plano area in Texas is majority white, but there's bullying between white students too. And them saying that they have a zero tolerance and then just kind of wrist slapping this, the boys, it just doesn't sit well with me. And, um, and more importantly, it doesn't sit well with the mother of this boy and nor with him. And so whatever they want justice to be, which they have a list of demands, that's what I want them to see before I let this go. So if you still see me tweeting about justice for Samarian in three months, it's because they didn't get what they were supposed to get. And um, so if you have the time, I would like to see more people talk about um, the Plano um, Independent School District and what they have not been doing as well as the Plano De Police Department, as well as just bullying all across the board. There's no reason why we should still have all of this in school and have administrators think that it's okay and to brush off parents when they come to say, my child is being bullied in your school, what are you gonna do? My child was called the N word and forced to drink a body fluid, what are you gonna do? and get this kind of lackadaisical answer. I, I don't think it's right and I'm gonna keep fighting for them. Thank and you I'm so much, Tinu. I, I've put the hashtags in the chat um, so that you can search those on Twitter. Also, if you would like, I'm going to link to a tweet thread that I made that has a script that you can follow if you would like to call the school officials. I just kind of noted down what I said. so. Make it real easy for everyone. Um, just kind of follow along with the script. And of course, Tino has been tweeting about it. I'm sorry? Thank you very much for doing the script because I didn't have one at all. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, no, of, of course. I'm just glad it was helpful. <laughs> um, we do have an audience member question. So I know we talked about how there isn't a quick fix to issues of oppression, but if you had one w thing, one thing that you wish able people could get through their heads that you never had to say ever again, what would that be? Mm. Uh, this is T Franklin. If 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 we can get, and it's not just able, right? It's disabled people. We do this as well. If we can just stop with the ableist slurs, the words, the phrases that are full of ableism. Like if I could, I swear, it's like a never ending, it just doesn't stop. These words don't stop, right? 
these these the c word the r word the the d word like there's so many words like the word lame lame means i can't walk i am a lame person I, i'm not courtney i am far from courtney okay let's get that straight but i can't walk that's the meaning of lame right so we need to be mindful of the words that we use because we are hurting for one we are hurting each other right? Because raise your hand if you are somebody who, when you do something wrong, like, oh, you're so, right? We are so quick to to label ourselves these words that are so harmful, right? No, you're you're not that S-T-U word. You're not that. You made a mistake. You did something wrong. But why do we default to these ableist words? Like, we got to stop. And if you are a writer, books, TV, film, poetry, rap, music, whatever, if you write, I encourage you, oh, my food here, ew, I encourage you to look through your recent work in progress and get rid of those words. There is a whole ass dictionary that you can find a different replacement and don't get a replacement. It means the same damn thing. If it, 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 oh my God, if that would just stop, my timeline would be, so, I would, if you follow me, you know, every day I'm saying something, I'm tired of, I shouldn't have to mute those words. I shouldn't have to, y'all need to remove them from your vocabulary. I'm tired of blocking people. I'm tired of telling people. I'm just tired. Can we stop the shit? Can you use a different word? I'm pretty sure you can, right? Because you definitely don't use the N-word. Well, we know some of y'all do. But if you don't be using the racist words and the homophobic words, you can stop using them ableist words. My name is T. Franklin. I'm done speaking. Thank you so much, T. Tinu, Raven, Ashley, Julia. Um, for me, I don't want to hear about special needs anymore because it gives the impression that we're getting something extra and that seeps into people's consciousness to think that, oh, we should cut that because it's extra. It's not extra. It's something that I need. Accommodations are not special. Everybody has accommodations, but it's only disabled people and people like us that have to be, you know, put under this umbrella of specialness. Just provide everybody with what they need. I'm Tina, I'm done speaking. Thank you, Tina. Raven? So I agree with what's been said so far. It's important for us to be mindful of the words we are using. So for example, in the deaf community, hearing people often identify us as hearing impaired. And that is not an appropriate term for uh, to be used for us. You can use a different word, such as hard of hearing. So like back in the day, that was the first word, you know, hearing impaired. And at first we were actually called deaf and dumb. And this was like, again, many generations ago um, due to like different deaths institutions, that's just how they dealt with us. So this is where all these negative labels come from, from back, from generations back. Also deaf mute, deaf mute and hearing impaired, both of those are inappropriate terms. And for centuries we have been fighting and to educate people that that is not the appropriate term to use. Please identify us as either hard of hearing or deaf, that's it. Hard of hearing or deaf, those are the only two words to identify us as. Now, if an individual person would prefer to be called hearing impaired, then okay, that's that individual person. And most likely they prefer that because they were not born deaf and they became deafened later in life. And they most likely don't understand the deaf culture and are not involved with the deaf culture. So if that individual person prefers to be called that, then okay, sure. But don't assume that that is what the entire community wants to be labeled as. So there's all of these assumptions, you know, that it's okay to generalize us and generalize our community with those words. So I'm making it clear that the two words that we prefer to use are either hard of hearing 
or death. Those two words. Oh, those two words, uh, deaf and hearing impaired are words that are often, that hearing people often think are offensive, but it's actually not offensive. Those two words are something that is proud, that we take, to, we take pride in that in our community. So please stop using hearing impaired. So again, like I'm, I'm just overstating it again, hearing impaired, deaf and dumb, deaf and mute, all of those, just leave that alone. Discontinue those words and only stick to hard of hearing or deaf. Thank you so much, Raven. I would like to jump in and, and tag on to Raven. Yeah. Also, tone deaf, blind spot. Are you deaf? All of that stuff. We, we it, it has to stop. It's not cool. Like, that ass, bro, it's not cool. And you're being offensive as hell. And if that doesn't bother you, and if you choose not to change knowing what these words mean, you're an ableist piece of shit. Point blank, period. I'm done speaking. Thank you, Tinu. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. I do want to no, give... No, sorry. My name is T. I am oh, not I'm so Tinu. so sorry. Thank you. Like, Thank you for correcting I, me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I uh, need more caffeine, probably. I am so sorry. Thank you for correcting me. Um, thank you, T. And we are coming to the end of our time. So I do just want to give Raven a chance to shout out a cause if there is one that she would like to. Um, other otherwise, we will we will wrap this up. So if I have a what, can you repeat that, please? If there's a cause that you would like to bring attention to, maybe a hashtag, something like that, that you would like to um, to shout out before we close. Oh, no, I don't have anything. But if I find something later, then, you know, I can definitely send you an email and you can send that out to your contacts. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you everyone for being here again. Thank you, Tinu. Thank you, T. Thank you, Raven, Ashley, Julia. I have been so excited for this panel. Um, and I'm so glad that we got to do this and that you all are here. We got to sit down with you. Your insight has been incredible to listen to. Um, and I hope that everyone is, is taking away as much from this as I have. And I think, uh, I think the theme here is that growth is uncomfortable but that's no excuse not to do it. And I hope that that is something that we can all embody as we continue on. Um, truly, thank you. And I guess that's it. Raven, you had a question? I just wanted to say thank you, Protest Access, for establishing this organization. I noticed. Sorry, interpreter is trying to get the message. Raven, can you repeat yourself for me? So again, I was saying thank you, Protest Access, for making this space available. I remember last year during the summertime, a lot of the protests were going on and there weren't a lot of captions. So I didn't know what was happening during this time. And so then I saw later on your page on Twitter that um, your videos began to have captions. And so I wanted to let you know that I appreciate that. And hopefully people see that and will follow suit and begin to add captions to their videos when different events or things of that nature continue to go on. And maybe there's people out there who wanna to volunteer to do those kinds of things. So again, just thank you. Thank you so much, Raven. And actually, now that you've mentioned that, if there is anyone in the audience who doesn't already volunteer with us, there's no time commitment, there's no experience requirement. You can just jump on in, do whatever you can. We have mentors who will literally take you through every step. Um, and we would always love to see more people join us. So 
thank you all again for being here. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, have a wonderful day, everybody. <laughs>